then I pulled out all the historical information I had about it. We were talking about a trail. We weren't talking about history, but I said, you know, it's in a really neat location for a lot of historical places around Natick. And I said, in particular, Henry Wilson's home is right up the street one way on 135, and his shoe shop is right out the other way on Route 135. This is kind of be a neat connector to that and to the uh, Underground Railroad stop on the railroad uh, back in the 1850s. And, uh, and Henry Wilson became a vice president of the U.S. But before that, he was a very, and after, he was a very avid aboli abolitionist around Natick. And he himself is the ultimate Horatio Alger story. But yeah. Horatio Alger moved to Natick <laughs> a little later and probably built his story on Henry Wilson. Oh, interesting. Uh, so I said, we have a lot of history here nobody knows anymore. These are made out of milk bottles. This is recycled lumber. It won't rot, won't warp. Bugs won't attack it. This section through here is bending my ankles as I walk. Yeah. And that's waiting for an accident. I think icy conditions in the fall or the spring. Is a early example of a European garden cemetery being tried in the U.S. Mount Auburn in West Cambridge is our famous one around here. But this is a really pretty cemetery. President Henry Wilson's family plot. Where's the vice president? This is a quiz. <laughs> the whole bunch of... Which one's the vice president? Probably the smallest, right? You got it. You got it. Except for the one buried in the grass, yes. And uh, my question to you is, how come? And my answer to you is, nobody can tell me the answer. And I think that's very fascinating. The big one is his only child, his son, raised as an abolitionist. And when the Civil War came along, at a very young age, his son became a Union officer, leading a black regiment. Well. Not the famous one in downtown Boston. So here's his son leading a black regiment. They have about a year, I believe, of really brave, heroic, successful service. And then, my God, this guy, he wasn't vice president yet, but he was the Senate co-chair of the War Appropriation Committee. He's handling the dollars for the war. He said, well, we better get his son out of combat now. He's a hero, but we don't have to kill him off. And they put him in an outpost out of the battle in Texas, where I think he, he may have drunk himself to death. They were also teetotalers, so I can just guess that left alone after all the battle action, he didn't do well out of it and not back home. And he died young uh, during the war as an officer, but after all his battles. So he got a fine tombstone. That's the Vice President of the United States. He did not die impoverished, and even if he had, you'd think he'd have a giant uh, monument. And that's what he's got. So to me, this is a wonderful enigma. Politicians didn't like him. They said he was unreliable, hmm. and he was. He'd been in four political parties. He'd join a party because they said they would free the slaves. And when they didn't, when they sold out to other, you know, more popular goals, he'd pick a new party that said they would do it. He did that four times. The last party he joined was the brand new Republican Party. And with that party, and with the Civil War, and with Lincoln, they freed the slaves. Quite the opposite of this year's Republican Party. They were quite liberal. <laughs> and uh, uh, so he joined that one. Well, all these politicians in Washington said, you used to be in our party, now you're not. You're unreliable. He was totally reliable. He went there to free slaves, and he stayed with it right on through when they would not. But that's how they saw it.